wonders to perform. That he loves the songwriter say he's sweet. I know. He's sweet, I know. Dark clouds may rise, strong winds may blow. But I tell the world, wherever I go, that I found a savior and he's sweet. I know. Amen. And so as we prepare to go into our Bible study for tonight, we still journeying through being positioned to seek, serve, and see. And the Lord is sharing something with us tonight we want to share with everyone uh, that's crucial. And brother spoke of it in his prayer. And our sister spoke of it in a prayer, and many have mentioned it. And so tonight we want you to uh, get your Bible and your pen and your papers for those who are watching online and everyone else as we prepare to walk through this, this lesson tonight. And uh, we're going to be dealing with three scriptures for foundational scriptures. Uh, two Old Testament scriptures and one New Testament scripture. It's going to be our foundational scripture for tonight. And what we're going to be dealing with is this for our lesson tonight. I want to talk about this. Be positioned to be designated by God as a holy child and not a hybrid counterfeit. Let's see this again. Be positioned to be designated by God as his holy child and not as a hybrid counterfeit. Amen. And so first scripture we want to look at for a foundational scripture is going to come from Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20. And we're going to read verse 26. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 26. It's going to be our first foundational scripture for tonight. Leviticus chapter 20. I want to invite you all to write these down too so you can also read them in your leisure. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 26. And this is what the word of the Lord said. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy. And I have separated you or severed ye from other people, that you should be mine. Amen. That's Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 26. And then if you will, move with us to Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verses 9 through 11. Je Jeremiah chapter 7 and verses 9 through 11. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, and it reads like this. It says, Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods, whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. Help us, Holy Ghost. In this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. And then turn with us to the book of First Peter. First Peter chapter 1. And verses 15 and 16. First Peter chapter 1. And verses 15 through 16. 
That's our New Testament scripture for tonight, the New Testament foundational scripture. And you'll notice it's familiar to the Leviticus chapter 20, 26 passage in the Old Testament. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 15 and 16. And this is what it says. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Amen. And so once again, we just want to deal with this subject for the lesson tonight. Be positioned to be designated by God as his holy child and not a hybrid counterfeit. Be positioned to be designated by God as his holy child and not a hybrid counterfeit. Now, as we walk through this, we're going to talk about a few things. The main thing we want to deal with is the difference between holy and hybrid. But the main thing we have to look at is this. Another word we want to look at is that word counterfeit. Counterfeit means it's something that is not real. It looks like it's real. It has the image that it's real, but it's not what it appears to be. A lot of times they say you get counterfeit money and you know when you go to the stores now, it used to be you give them a 10 or 20 or whatever, now they have a pen that they mark those $20 bills with because they want to make sure that those bills are real money. And in the same way as the people walking and looking at the stores, the clerk in the stores, check that bill to see if it's real. Thank you, Holy Ghost. God checks people to see if they're real. And we talked about this right at the beginning of COVID, how he was doing an evaluation to determine who truly were his children and who were counterfeits, who were pretending to be his children. And, and God exposed a lot of people who many of us would never would have believed were counterfeits and not Christians. And so once again, what's the difference between being viewed as holy versus being viewed as a hybrid? And hybrid, that's a term you hear now in contemporary circles, especially with vehicles and computers and technology. You have hybrid vehicles, which means they can run on gas, they can run on electricity. You have the same thing with different types of, of technologies that can be used and run on different things. But the term holy in the biblical context means this. It means to be sacred ceremonially and morally. That means by the rituals and the things that you are doing, they should be done in a manner that is sacred in the sight of God. Another way to put it when you're talking about being sacred and ceremonial and morally, it means this. To be free from defilement that's associated with his children, crimes, idolatry, and other unclean and profane things. Now notice this is what's going on in the midst of society right now. Criminality, idolatry, and if you're talking about profane things, that means profanity, words being spoken through profanity, profane acts, profane deeds. All of these things count as being things that defile a person. Holy also means this. It means to be a saint of God. It means to be a sanctuary of God. It means to be set apart. That means consecrated and sanctified by God and for God. And it means to be one in God. And that's very important because the church is supposed to be unified, sanctified, bonded in oneness with God. Also, when you look at it, to be holy, and this is significant, this is very important, to be holy is to be one in God, one with God, and one of God. So if you're not God's child, you can't say you're holy. You can say, well, you can say it, but that doesn't mean you are. A lot of people will say that they're God's children, they're God's people. But unless you are one of God's, truly one of God's, you're one of those persons who are not holy, but they are attempting to be what we want to call a hybrid. Now, when we look at Scripture, 
Many times this is pointed out about being one in God and one with God and one of God. In John chapter 17, verses 17 to 22, it records Jesus praying, and hear this, for his disciples to be sanctified, to be holy, to be one. And we say this because in that same chapter, when Jesus was uttering this prayer to God, he said these words. He said, I don't pray for the world, but I pray for the ones who are mine who are in the world. Now, if, if I was just to say that, well, oh, he's saying you're not supposed to pray for the world. I'm just saying what Jesus said. He said he does not pray for the world because the world represents that which is not of God. And he's talking about those people who are out doing whatever they want to do, serving whoever they want to serve. That consists of the world. And then there's a prayer warrior said tonight, Satan is the ruler of the world. That's his domain. God is controlled and God is over everything. But Satan operates in worldly things. Now, notice what Jesus prayed. He said, sanctify them in the truth. That means set them apart for your purposes and make them holy. And then he says, your word is truth. And so in order for us to be holy, in order for us to be sanctified and to be, sanct to be set apart, we have to be in the word of God. That's what we're doing tonight. In Bible study, in Sunday school, in worship, at home, in our own spare, in our devotional time, we must be in the word. And when we're in the word, we gain truth. And when we gain truth, we grow in holiness. See what I said? We grow in holiness. Then in verse 18, he said, Just as you commissioned and sent me into the world, I also have commissioned and sent them who are the believers into the world. For their sake, he said, I sanctified myself to do your will. In other words, Jesus set apart himself. He allowed himself to be made holy so that he can do the will of God. And he said, so that they also may be sanctified, set apart, dedicated, and be made holy in your truth. Then he says this, I do not pray for these alone. And when he talked about these, he was talking about the 12 who were with him. But he said, it is not just for their sake only that I make this request, but also for all those who will ever believe and trust in me through their message. In other words, Jesus prayed for us. Before we were born, Jesus prayed for us. Before we were in our mother's womb, Jesus prayed for us. Before we knew ourselves, Jesus prayed for us. And that prayer still stands for those of us who believe. And he says this, that they all may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, so that the world may believe without any doubt that you sent me. He said, I have given to them the glory and honor which you have given me, that they may be one just as we are one. We cannot be divided and say we are holy. We cannot be in a confrontation with each other and say we are holy. We cannot be fighting and bickering and backsliding and backbiting and, and doing all these things to put each other down and say that we are Christians and then claim that we are God's holy people. That just doesn't go together. Now, we look at this in Romans 12 and 5. Said this, Paul said, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So we are all one in the body of Christ. Even though we are separate individuals, we are still separate members, but we all make up the body. Then in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, and I'm reading the Amplified Bible version of it tonight. Paul speaks of unity and oneness of the spirit. This is what he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. He says, so I, the prisoner for the Lord, appeal to you to live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. That is, to live a life that exhibits godly character, moral courage, personal integrity, and mature behavior. A life that expresses gratitude for God for your salvation. In everything, give God the glory. Nothing that we do is done on our own. 
Nothing that we do should be done for us to claim all of the limelight and gain all of the fame and fortune. And that's what you find in the world, where entertainers are seeking to have their name and lights, to have all this glory and all this fame. That is temporary. And just as quickly as they get it, it passes away. Then he says, with all humility, that means forsaking self-righteousness and gentleness, which means maintaining self-control with patience, bearing with one another, in unselfish love, make every effort to keep the oneness of the spirit and the bond of peace. That means each individual working together to make the whole successful. It's not just about me, it's about us, it's about Jesus. His name has us in it. If I make it about myself, then I'm not fulfilling what God sent me to do. Do we do this? He says this. There's one body of believers and one spirit just as you were called to one hope when called to salvation. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and hear this, one Father of us all who is sovereign over all and working through all and living in all. Without God, as the song say, we are nothing. As Paul said, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Now, we know that being holy is crucial. We know it's significant. We know that it's vital. And we know that it's truly precious in the sight of God. And the reason why we can conclude this is because the word holy is mentioned some 546 times. That's in the King James Version of the Bible. In one version, as I was looking at it, it was mentioned 747 times. And when I looked at it, I thought about the 747 jet. So you think about it. God saying holy is like being a 747 jet. And that's a luxurious jet. That's the largest jet, one of the largest jets they made at the time. But this is the thing. They've, had, they've made larger jets, but none has been more dependable. None has been more, uh, as you say, where it was always doing what it was meant to do. That plane probably has crashed less than any other plane that man has ever made. Now, we look at this, and we know how important it is to Jesus, to Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, how holiness is important. Throughout the Holy Scripture, there's reference made to the word holy in some form or variation. There's holy ground, holy convocation, holy habitation, holy Sabbath, holy ark, holy temple, holy hill, holy seed a holy nation, holy men, a holy place, a holy house, holy garments, a holy linen coat, holy things, holy gifts, holy crown, holy ointment, holy anointing oil, holy word, holy day, holy sanctuary, holy name, holy ghost, holy spirit, Holy God, holy water, holy instruments, holy people, holy vessels, holy arm, holy promise, holy city, city, holy for the Lord, holy unto you. And the main one we hear a lot of times in scripture is most holy. So that tells us just how important holiness is to God and how important it is for us to be positioned in holiness and to be positioned as God's holy people. Now, when it comes to that term hybrid, this is what we're dealing with. Hybrid is used to define those things which are devised to operate using multiple components or alternative, alternate processes. Now, when I think and I saw that word devised because it said we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. That means he devises things. To come up against us. And so notice, the term has become popularized primarily in the automotive industry, basically because there are hybrid vehicles, as we said, that function using gasoline and or electricity as a source for powering the engine. Now this is the thing. Hybrid vehicles alternate between gasoline powered operation and electrical powered operation, depending upon the particular 
driving condition. Now, here's the thing we have to deal with. Hybrid principles don't work for Christian living. It may work for a car, and a lot of times it doesn't work for the vehicle. Because in the midst, in the midst of changing over, sometimes the car just stops running. And so that tells you, in the midst of trying to switch over from one thing to the other, in the midst of motion, thank you, Holy Ghost, it causes a problem with the engine's ability to interpret what it should be doing. Now, it appears that many people attempt to apply the principles of hybrid vehicle operation to how Christians can live their life. They are of the opinion that alternating between the consecrated and the carnal, the good and the bad, the holy and the unholy, the moral and the immoral, the right and the wrong, praise and profanity, sacred and sacrilege, salvation and sin, the word and the world, the church house and the clubhouse is not a problem as long as they pay tithes, give offerings, or show up for church service sometime during the month. Not throwing at nobody, not talking about nobody, just presenting the point of what God said. However, this is what we have to understand. God reveals in his word that he sees the action of these people as a disregard to live holy. He views it that their actions also show a lack of respect and recognition for how they are to come into the Lord's sacred house and present themselves before the Most High and Holy God. Therefore, that brings us to our scripture, our foundation of scripture. In Jeremiah, we said this. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say this. We are delivered to do all these abominations. Help us, Holy Ghost. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? He says, behold, I, even I, have seen it. We talked about what God said in a, in a message a couple of Sundays ago. God said, I see you. Just because you think he doesn't see doesn't mean he doesn't. And the part in this scripture where it talks about they come and they say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. This is the part where you have the so-called preachers. And as Jesus says, teaching them in error, what he's given them, what they're giving them is erroneous doctrine. They believe because Jesus died on the cross because God says, well, they say God expects you to make a mistake, but a mistake and a sin are two different things. They say God knew you were going to do that, so it's all right for you to do it. They are telling them that it's all right to commit abomination that God said he's not pleased with and that they can do it and that God's going to accept it. And that is not true. Now, Matthew 6 and 24 records how Jesus conveys that the hybrid principle does not work with respect to Christian living. Jesus addressed it. And this is what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24. He said, no man is able to be a servant to two masters. For he will hate for the one or love for the other. Or he will keep to the one or have no respect for the other. You may not be servants of God and of wealth. The, the King James says servants of God and mammon. You, you can't do it. You can't go between God and good, word and world. And, and I thank the Lord he brought this, 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 this analogy to me years ago. And I know our children today really don't really know anything about it. They may have seen it on some of the playground. But one of the favorite things we had on the playground was monkey ball. And the thing about the monkey balls, it was designed where you had to reach and reach, but you had to let go behind in order to move forward. And I, I thank the Lord for this because he gave me this scenario. He said, you remember back in the day when you were on the playground? And it was always somebody that was kind of afraid because they were afraid to let go of the monkey ball. They were afraid that their hand was going to slip. And so what they would do, some would hold on like this, 
And they say, but you got to reach for the next one. And they say, I can't do it because if I turn loose, I'm going to fall. Then you had the one who had the ability and the courage for a little while to reach forward and grab the other one, but they were like this. And so instead of letting go of the one behind, they would hold on. And what would happen, ooh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Their arm would be stretched just like this. Now, now who had arms was stretched like that, that we know of? That was Jesus. But he was nailed to the cross, so he couldn't fall to the ground. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And so your arms would be like this. Over a period of time, if you tried to stay there, you would get tired and you would fall. But you always had one of the other kids, one of the bullies, or one of the older kids, who would come, instead of just going around you, they would come and put their legs around you, and they pull you down. That's Satan. He wants you to hold on to the world. He wants you to hold on to the word, knowing that you can't do both. And while you're trying to hold on to both, he comes and he pulls you down. And when you fall, you fall directly into the dust. But in the case of Satan, when you fall, your fall leads you directly to hell. Now, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke also document Jesus addressing what God advised and announced in Jeremiah 7, 9 through 11. The very thing that he talked about in that scripture, Jesus addressed it. In those gospels, it declares that Jesus said this, and it said that Jesus did this. And this happened when he was getting ready to go to Calvary, before he went to Calvary, y'all. And we remember this. It said, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and said to them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Once again, that's what we see. You cannot separate Old and New Testament. To get rid of the Old Testament would be literally to get rid of the words that Jesus preached, the walk that Jesus walked, and the things that Jesus did. Because now you see Jesus reciting this very scripture from Jeremiah. And he's doing the very thing that his father said he would do, related to those who thought that they could come into his house and defile his house and get away with it and everything was all right. Now, we must understand and be aware that some people make Christian claims, but they have hybrid characteristics. I'll say this again. Some people make Christian claims, but they have hybrid characteristics. There's a politician running for an office right now. First thing he says in this commercial, I'm a Christian. But why you got to tell me that? Your works ought to speak for you. You don't have to get on there and tell me I'm a Christian. If you're a Christian, everything that you're doing is going to be demonstrated. But you're saying you're a Christian. But then when they start to evaluate the works, it's not. There are some people who by their words say they are true Christians, but who by their works show they are truly hybrid. A person who claims to be a Christian but conveys hybrid characteristics is what James 1 and 8 declares is this. They are a double-minded man unstable in all their ways. And, and I always remember this. My dad would tell me this. My uncle would tell me this. They say, be careful with a person that, that never, don't never have a steady stance on anything. They're dangerous. They, 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 they're one way here and the next way there, you've got to, you got to watch them because they're they dangerous. Stay away from them. But then it says this. Joshua confronted these type of people by saying these words. He said, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. That's what's recorded in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, where Joshua made a decision. He said he wanted to be holy and not a hybrid. Then we find this in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. 
It recalls Elijah, Elijah posed a question to these type of people. Elijah came to all those people and he said this, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And notice what he said, but the people answered him not a word. Then the apostle Paul presented his position on the matter in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. This is what it says he proclaimed. He said, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And hear what he says, children. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, Know what he said in the word? He said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In his Old Testament passage that he spoke in this, in this word, Jesus came and fulfilled it because he dwelled in the midst of the people. He walked among the people. And to this day, for those of us who have received him, he dwells in us. He talked to him and said, he is our God. And he says that we are his people. Now, God reveals his plan for those who declare they are holy word prompted people, but they dabble in hybrid world practices. Uh, and this is the thing, a lot of times, this is the word you hear a lot of times in this generation they'll say it. I'm a spiritual person. Be careful, because you know that they didn't say nothing about holy. And so, it's a difference between being a spiritual person and God already knew this was going to come about. And so he addressed this in Old Testament scripture. So for those, if somebody comes up to you and tries to, uh, I guess, impress you by saying, I'm a, I'm a spiritual man, I'm a spiritual woman, woman, I believe in God, I'm spiritual, I'm spiritual. Be careful because God speaks of that. And he speaks of all of these things. This is what he said. In Leviticus chapter 20, Verses 6 through 8, and write this down. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 6 through 8. And when you get the opportunity to read all of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 20, because some things in there too, about many things. But in verses 6 through 8, and I read an Amplified Bible version, this is, what he, this is what he says. As for the person who turns to mediums, who consult the dead, are to spiritists, that's these, these, these spiritual uh, stores and spiritual people who, who sell herbs and, and stones and crystals and uh, even zodiac signs and like Sister Eve and, and Madam Marks, all the stuff they used to have back in the day. He says, those who turn to these people, this is what he says, to play the prostitute after them. That means they're basically selling themselves to them and giving themselves to them and allowing them to use them. He said this, I shall set my face against that person and will cut him off from his people, excluding him from the atonement made for them. Help us, Holy Ghost. That part of the passage goes in line with what Jesus, what Paul talked about in Hebrews when he said those who sin willfully and know that they're committing a sin. He said that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross does not work for them. It does them no good. His sacrifice does not save them. He said, matter of fact, by them willfully sinning, it's as if they're crucifying him all over again. And so you have to be careful when you start saying, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go and talk to this. I'm going to follow this medium. I'm going to check to see what my zodiac is and all. Be careful. Because that means you're turning away from the true God and his truth. And you're seeking after things that he said we are not to do. And so he says this. You shall consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy. For I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. He says, I am the one who makes you holy. Without me, he said, without him... We cannot be holy. 
Without Jesus, we cannot be holy. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot be holy. Then, in Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, and we know this scripture, children. Revelation chapter 3, and verses 15 and 16. And we're familiar with this. Very familiar with this. We've heard this in church as little children. At some point, we've heard it. This is what it says. This is what Jesus says to John. I know thy works. And he's talking about the churches, the seven churches. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. This is how the Amplified Bible version presents it. It says it this way. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold, that means you're not invigorating or refreshing, nor hot, that means nor are you healing or therapeutic. He said, I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, and this is what lukewarm means scripturally, it means you are spiritually useless. And, and I thought about what my old pastor said when I was a child. He said, he said, children, when you get to the point where you think you know everything, <laughs> he said, you may as well just leave and go home. And he said, he said, don't become so spiritually high that you are just no earthly good. And, and I, I wonder what he meant by that. Because he said, don't, don't allow yourself to get in a situation well, you become so spiritual that you're not Holy Spirit driven that you literally become useless in the sight of people and in the sight of God. And then he says, and neither hot or cold, he said, I will vomit you out of my mouth, rejecting you with disgust. And this is the thing, and we, we, we know this, and the scripture talks about this. When humans do this, this is not something that humans do not do. When humans regurgitate, they don't go back to it and consume it again. But he used the part of the scripture, he said, they have become like the dog who's returned to his vomit. That means a holy person doesn't, he said, beware, don't go back to that old way. That's why the old people say, the things I used to do, I don't do no more. He said, I can't turn back. My, old, my aunt would say this, I can't turn back. I got to keep pressing forward because that's what it means to be holy. You cannot find yourself in a situation where you turn and be hybrid and you lose everything. So as we conclude tonight, God is not partial to or pleased by someone who attempts to be a holy hybrid. I'm going to say this again. God is not partial to or pleased by someone who attempts to be a holy hybrid. And, 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 and a lot of times people make fun of this type of thing. Uh, I heard people say they were a, a hops Christian. That meant they drank beer. And they had a Bible study where they would drink beer. There was another one where they said they were ganja Christian, which meant they would go to Bible studies and they would actually smoke, smoke marijuana and weed and these type of things. That's getting dangerous. God, that, you, you're playing with God at that point. Then it says this. This is what to understand. It is not an option for occupancy in God's kingdom. God doesn't say for you to get in, you've got to be a holy hybrid. No person who is truly a child of God, a disciple of Christ, and a student of the Holy Spirit can be holy and hybrid. You can't be both. None of us can be both. When it comes to living our daily lives under the banner of born-again believers in Christ Jesus, we have to understand something. And this is the only way, best way or one of the ways we can kind of break it down to this. There can be no merciful and messy on Monday. No truthful and treacherous on Tuesdays. No worshipful and wicked on Wednesdays. No trusting and threatening on Thursdays. No faithful and filthy on Fridays. No sanctified and seductive on Saturdays. And you can't be saved and sadistic on Sundays. You, can't, you just can't be woke. You can't be a disciple and a demon all at the same time. Because God's going to look at it like this. You're either one or the other. And so our advisement and encouragement is to be God's holy child and not a hybrid counterfeit. Be like the old people said, Lord, I'm your child. 
desire to say, Lord, I, I, I want to be your child. Be like David. Lord, don't take your spirit away from me. No matter what you do, you can take away everything else, but don't take your spirit away from me. And so understand this tonight. God provides specific insight to his children with regards to who they are and who they ought to be. We said this once before. I am who God says I am. That's what the desire is to be. Be who God says you are. Not about the word, but what people say. Because people are going to say all kinds of things, and they're doing it to destroy you and to put you down and to cause you to lose your position and, uh, and, and doubt who you are in God. God provides specific insight to his children with regards to who they are and who they are to be. And this is what we want to share with you, and we'll be finished. The Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. This is what it says. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, marked out by the Lord your God to be his special people out of all the nations on the face of the earth. That's what he told the people of Israel. He said, I've chosen you. I picked you out. You're my people. You're my people, and I'm your God. He said, that's what I need you to remember. You are my people, and I'm your God. And so much to the point, that's where the Pharisees and the chief priests and the Sadducees made their mistake. They took this scripture, but they took it to mean that they own God and nobody else could have it. And God had already put it in place. He said, I'm, Israel's going to be my nation, but he said through the Gentiles and all the other nations of the world are going to come unto me. And he told them in that day, he told Moses, he said, if they decide that they want to serve me, let them serve me. Don't reject them. Don't prevent them from serving me. Because if he, you present pre, 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 prohibit them from serving me, then I'm going to have a problem with you. And so here he says, he made the decision. He says who we are. He says we are his special people. Remember what Peter said, a chosen generation, a raw priesthood, and then in the New Testament, that we're reading right now, 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 14 through 16. First Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 15, two through 16. This is what he says. Hear what it says. I'm reading this thing. Like children ruled by God, do not go back to the old desires of the time when you were without knowledge. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Because this is what God said. He said, my people perish because of a lack of knowledge. Jesus made this statement in the New Testament. He was talking to the disciples. He said, he who puts his hand on the gospel plow and removes it is not fit for the kingdom. And so you see Jesus following up with everything that his daddy said. Jesus came and preached it to the people and made it clear to the people. And so this is what Peter wrote in his epistle. Like children ruled by God. Understand what he said, ruled by God. Do not go back to the old desires of the old time of the time when you were without knowledge. But be holy in every detail of your lives. As he whose servants you are is holy. Because it has been said in the writings, and Peter is pulling. From Leviticus. You are to be holy. For I am holy. And so once again. That's why I said. You cannot separate old from new. Because they are connected together. That's oneness. God is not divided. And he said. In order for you to be holy. It requires that you be one. That you walk in oneness. That means walk in oneness with his word. In faith. In belief. With God. Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit. Walk in oneness with each other. 
You can't, we can't be divided. It's just not a tug of war. Nobody's trying to win nothing. Everything is about God getting the glory. Everything is about God getting the glory. And so when we start saying that we are God's children, but everything we do is designed to hurt versus help and heal, God said, you're not mine. And we'll leave with this. Jesus talked about when the time comes for the people to come before the throne. And he talked about the wheat and the tares. And he talked about that. And the disciples said, Lord, do you want us to separate him? He said, no, because you don't know how to do it. If you do it, you're going to pull up the wheat and the tares, and the wheat's going to die. So right there, he said, you don't have the ability to do it. Your judgment will not allow you to do it. You're going to mess it up if you try to do it. He says, but the father is going to send his harvester. He's going to do it. He's going to be do the separating. He's going to separate the weeds from the tares. And then he also said that he's going to separate the goats from the sheep. The goats are the hybrids. The sheep are the holy. To the goats who claim they did all these things in the name of Jesus, he says he's just going to look at them and say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And he's basically going to say, be gone to hell with Satan and the rest of the deceivers. But to the sheep, to the holy, he's going to say, come, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to your rest. You are faithful over a few things. I'm making you ruler over me. So in the midst of all of this, we can't fool God because God sees everything. And so just remember this and keep this in mind, children. I want to be a holy child. I don't want to be a hybrid counterfeit. I want God to look at us as saying that we are real, we are true. Every starlight, we are true. Starlight means you have genuine light. That means you have the light of God shining on you, in you, around you, from you. But when it's artificial light, just like any light bulb, it can blow out at any minute. And once it blows out, notice this. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Hmm. Once a light bulb blows out, you cannot put light back in it. Think about it. What, what, once it's blown out, the only thing you can do is throw it in the trash. Or they have to send it to a recycler. And nowadays, a lot of times, they won't even, the recyclers won't even receive it. Why? Because they can't make a profit from it. So let us be that starlight, that genuine light that God says will never go out. Not be an artificial light and a light bulb that once it goes out, it never gives off life, light again. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you, Father God, for all you share. Thank you, Father God, for all you show. Thank you, Father God, for all you give. And Father God, we just ask that you would touch all those that are online tonight, those of us who are in the building tonight. Continue to let your light shine from us, in us, and on us. Let us be your holy children and not let us be hybrid counterfeits. And Father God, just help us, Father God, to continue to walk in the light, the beautiful light that Jesus Christ has placed within each and every one of us. And, Father, we continue to pray, Father God, for bereaved families. We continue to pray, Father God, for the Stevenson family. We continue to pray for all of those, Father God, for the passing of their, their loved ones. Pray for all of those, Father God, who are dealing with the passing of loved ones today. And, Father, just ask that you would comfort, that you would keep them in your keeping care. Continue to pray for our starlights who may be in rehabilitation or going through, have gone through surgeries and dealing with the situation that the enemy has tried to place upon them to attack them and to prevent them. But, Father God, we know that you are able. And so, Father God, we just ask that you would touch, that you would strengthen. And, Father God, if there's anyone out there tonight who is in need of a prayer, who's wondering about what they're going to do, what they need to do, let them know tonight that Jesus is the way. Look to him. Call upon his name. Simply say, Lord, have mercy. Save me, Lord. Save me from this darkness. Save me from this depression. Save me from this addiction. 
Whatever it is that may be a hindrance tonight, Father God, we speak a word in their life. And Father God, we know when we speak a word and the word comes from you, that you're able to do what you said you would do. And so, Father, we speak it for your glory, for your honor, that someone will be saved, someone will be lifted, and someone will be restored, and most of all, that someone will be edified and empowered by what went on tonight and the prayer that has gone forth from these walls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, and thank God. All right, children, we thank God once again for this opportunity, and once again, be positioned to be God's holy child. Don't be a hybrid counterfeit. Amen. And so may God continue to bless you as you go forth on your day with his I am that I am. And we'll see you next time.